the most recent book that uh, Professor Friedman uh, has written uh, is here up on the board called Breaking the Line. Uh, and it's a wonderful book about uh, one particular season in uh, black college football uh, that had uh, tremendous ramifications uh, for the civil rights movement. Uh, and um, he'll be speaking about that book today and generally that subject matter uh, will go till about 10 of or so and then if you have any questions, you'll be able to uh, ask questions of Professor Friedman. So uh, here is Professor Sam Friedman from Columbia University. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Kramer and, and Mr. Hart, for allowing me to come back here to Austin and to UT. I had a great time speaking to a couple of different classes in the fall of 2013, right after the book came out. And it's great to know that there's still interest in, in the subject matter. And I also say, as someone from Columbia Journalism School, uh, we know of and really admire the journalism program here at, uh, at UT and actually envy what you're able to do with sports media um, in particular. And if anyone, by the way, has any curiosity, I don't want to steal your future grad students, but if anyone is curious about wanting to apply to Columbia Journalism School for grad school, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll put my email address or, or give it out a little bit later or, uh, or Professor um, Kramer can share it with you, but I'd be happy to either answer questions or help steer them, steer you to the people who can. The other thing I think that'll help put today in context is that I know you've come up really through the Jackie Robinson era up through into the late 1940s, and next week with Andrew Marinus, whose work I know, um, you're gonna look at a similar period of time to what I'm covering today, but an interesting sort of alternate version of how to make social change. In, in his wonderful book, Strong Inside, he writes about kind of a Jackie Robinson-esque figure, that kind of one African-American pioneer, in his case, a basketball player named Perry Wallace, who desegregates a previously all-white conference, the Southeastern Conference, when he's playing basketball <coughs> for Vanderbilt. And that was one way to make social change. But another way, which I'll talk about a lot today, is what came out of this parallel universe of what we now know as the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities in this country, and what people in that world did to try to contribute to the movement. So the movement operated, the civil rights movement that is operated in several different ways simultaneously, all towards the same goal. And I also want to talk about today what's so important about football and why football is getting desegregated, college football, so much later in many cases than baseball. And just to give you a starting point, I don't know, does anyone know the name James Meredith? From, so who's James Meredith? Exactly. It's the first African-American student to attend the University of Mississippi. And does anyone know, this will be a tougher one, who Ross Barnett is or was? Well, you're on it. Who's Ross Barnett? He's the governor. governor of Mississippi. These two photos are taken within 24 hours of each other. So right here, this is James Meredith in the middle trying to enroll at the University of Mississippi. And he needs federal marshals, U.S. marshals, federal law enforcement protection to be able to go onto the campus and register. That's happening, actually, I believe it's on a Sunday, interestingly, a Sunday in September of 1961. This is Saturday night before that Sunday. There's Ross Barnett with the stars and bars, the Confederate flag, and he is attending a football game at Memorial Stadium in Jackson, Mississippi, named in honor of war veterans, including the veterans of the Confederacy. And that night, the University of Mississippi's highly ranked football team is playing Kentucky. And at halftime of the game, Ross Barnett goes out to midfield and gets on a microphone and gives an impromptu speech along the lines of, I love this state, I love her people, I love her traditions. And the crowd goes crazy because this is barely coded language for saying, I'm in favor of segregation and it should always be this way in Mississippi. And the people in the stadium, which is entirely segregated, 
it would be years before black teams were allowed to play in that stadium, are responding in kind, waving flags and howling and hooting and so forth, because they know he's making that statement apropos of James Meredith being about to enroll in Mississippi at, at the university under, you know, under the protection of the federal government. And I don't think it's just coincidental that Ross Barnett makes that statement at a football game, at a University of Mississippi football game, because there are many elements to the world of segregation in the South. You know, we know the waiting rooms, separate waiting rooms. Um, some of us know about George Wallace at the University of Al or the governor of Alabama, who famously declared segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. There he is in 1963, standing in front of what was called the schoolhouse door, the door to the administration building at the University of Alabama, defying the federal government as it was seeking to have two African-American students admitted to the University of Alabama. So we're familiar with a lot of that. And we're familiar, especially as we've gone through these anniversaries the last couple of years, of a lot of the iconic moments in civil rights history, the I Have a Dream speech, the, you know, the March on Washington, um, Bull Connor turning his d police dogs and fire hoses loose on the freedom marchers in Birmingham, the bombing by you know, white supremacist terrorists of 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, um, Medgar Evers, the NAACP president in Mississippi being assassinated, John F. Kennedy finally, after years of being very timid about civil rights, getting on national television to give a speech, finally endorsing the Civil Rights Bill, which is the bill that Lyndon Johnson pushed through. And you know, how many of you saw the film Selma? So at least some of you, what that film does, you know, in you know, biopic form is talk about really how both the civil rights movement, including not only Martin Luther King, but Hosea Williams and Ralph Abernathy, John Lewis, James Bevel, a number of other people, you know, raising public awareness, putting their own bodies at risk, and the President Johnson working with Congress in Washington combined to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was the bill that John F. Kennedy was alluding to in that speech. So we're familiar with some of that history, but the point I want to make today, and fortunately I know you're already familiar with this concept, is that sports wasn't just sort of fun and games somewhere off to the side. And football is the sport I'll be particularly talking about. That sports, and in the segregated South, college football in particular, was one of the major arenas for civil rights activity. And the reason it was is that sports, and I'm going to say here specifically college football, was one of the pillars of the system of segregation. It was one of the pillars of it. It wasn't coincidentally segregated because, you know, bus station waiting rooms and seating on city buses and movie theaters and so forth were segregated. It was one of the most zealously protected parts of the system of Jim Crow. So you can see that right here. You know, this is Alabama's football team, all white. This is Mississippi's cheerleaders in the garb meant to evoke Confederate uh, soldier uniforms. This is a verse from Alabama's fight song. To this day, your Dixie's football pride, Crimson Tide. Now, some people will say that was just sort of an appeal to regional pride, but I don't think so. I say this kind of what we call a dog whistle, if you know that term. Do you know that term, dog whistle? Anyone know that? What, what's a dog whistle? What's unique about a dog whistle? Right, the dog, can't, the dog can hear it, but the humans can't. So it's kind of a hidden message. So when we call a bit of phrasing of language a dog whistle, it means that it's speaking in a subliminal way. So I think what that fight song is saying in this verse is it's not just regional pride. Certainly, at this time, black people in Alabama didn't think that they were part of the triumph of Alabama's all-white football team. It was saying throughout the segregated South, when our all-white team wins, White supremacy wins. And why was that so true in college football? It's hard, understandably, for your generation to even conceive it, but just imagine this. First of all, think about a sports media landscape in which, or, or a sports ownership 
landscape, a sports industry landscape in which there's no pro baseball anywhere south of Washington, D.C. or St. Louis. No pro baseball anywhere in the southeast. There's no pro basketball south of Baltimore and again St. Louis or maybe even at that point Chicago. No pro basketball in the south. If we're talking about the 19 50s before the American Football League forms, there's no pro football anywhere south of Washington, D.C., or again, St. Louis. Or, and even after the AFL, the upstart rival league, which later merged with the NFL, starts, it puts a few teams in the Sun Belt. They start a team in Houston, they start a team in Dallas. A few years later, you know, 65 or 66, they put a team in Miami. It's true. But those are startups. No one's even sure that league is going to succeed. And so you're talking about a sports landscape in the South in which college football is the unchallenged game of the region. And it has an almost religious kind of importance. It has no rivals. Everyone, if you think there's a deep connection in this part of the country to college football now, as there is, the way people feel about UT or Texas A&M or LSU, or you know, University of Florida, any of them, imagine what that would be like with no Miami Heat, with no Dallas Cowboys, with no Houston Texans, with no Tennessee Titans, with no you know, New Orleans Pelicans. I think that, aren't they the Pelicans now? Do I have that right? New, New Orleans Pelicans or Memphis Grizzlies? Nothing. College football is everything. And college football is seen as a result as being too important to desegregate. I talked about James Meredith before, 1961, he's allowed to attend the University of Mississippi. Talked about George Wallace before, in 1963 he's trying to defy the federal government, but the fact is, three weeks after this photo was taken, he has to relent, and two black students enter the University of Alabama. And this is happening throughout the South in the early 60s at both public and private universities. Student bodies are being desegregated. And yet, it takes almost a decade, sometimes more than a decade, for the football teams to be desegregated. Alabama doesn't have a black player recruited for its football team until 1970 or 71. University of Mississippi and LSU, the last two in the Southeast Conference, don't desegregate their football teams till I think 72 or 73. A lot of you being Longhorns, You've grown up on the legend of that famous 1969 game against Arkansas, right? You all know about that game? What's the significance of that game? Last all white national champion. Oh, you are way ahead. Excellent. Right, you've jumped to the answer. It was famous at one level because it was unbeaten Texas versus unbeaten Arkansas playing on a December Saturday afternoon for, there was no, you know, BCS title game back then. So this was the de facto national championship, number one playing number two. The President Nixon is at the game, Reverend Billy Graham is at the game, it's on national TV. And 1969, there's not a single black player on either team, 1969. And I'm not sure what year UT desegregated its student body, but I'm sure it was at least six, seven, maybe even longer than that years before. So this was no accident, and the same thing was true at private universities, Tulane, for instance, Tulane University in New Orleans. They had a student come in, an African-American student in the mid-60s who had played both baseball and football as a star in high school, and he was instructed at Tulane, don't try to play football here. That's going to be too difficult. We'll try to break the racial barrier, break the color line with baseball first. Because football had this exalted power culturally and again, to come back to something I said before, it made it too important to white supremacy, too important to the Jim Crow system to be desegregated. And also because football being this proving ground meant that if you were ever to have a black college play a white college in football and the black team won, then it would be a disaster for the whole concept of white supremacy because it wasn't just a matter of separating the races, it was tied in with ideas of whites being superior, being smarter, 
being better organized, keeping their composure better, et cetera, et cetera, and blacks being quote unquote natural athletes, which is another dog whistle, is sort of a code word for kind of animalistic, okay? So these were the attitudes, and the idea that a black coach might ever be able to outcoach a white coach, that couldn't be allowed to happen because that would undermine a lot of the presumptions of white supremacy. And what was going on simultaneously this when I talk about the parallel universe before the HBCUs are these roughly 100 colleges, mostly in the South, a few were in border states like Pennsylvania um, and Maryland and Ohio. And some of them have been founded by religious denominations, but most of them are set up by the state governments of these states. And they're set up for one reason initially. They're set up so we don't have to desegregate our own cherished all-white state universities. So in Texas, if you don't want to desegregate UT or, or A&M or you know, North Texas, you're going to set up Prairie View A&M. And the black students will go there. Um, if you're in Florida and you don't want to desegregate Florida State and the University of Florida, you set up Florida A&M. If you're in South Carolina and you don't want to desegregate the University of South Carolina, you set up South Carolina State and so on. But the remarkable thing that happened at these schools is that even though they'd been set up to be inferior, they were not given equivalent resources to white schools. They were not initially allowed to teach anything besides very practical subjects like education, you know, agriculture, mechanical engineering, is that ultimately because of the sense of ownership that black people felt of these institutions, they became these agencies for black advancement and ultimately for the civil rights movement. So I could be here all day just telling you how important these schools have been to black history in America. Just suffice it to say without the HBCUs, we wouldn't have black history as we know it. But just for starters, if any of you have read Invisible Man, in any of your literature classes, Ralph Ellison up there in the upper left, the, the author of Invisible Men, went to Tuskegee. Thurgood Marshall, who of course we know Brown versus Board of Ed, he's the one who argues and wins that decision at the Supreme Court and becomes the first African-American Supreme Court justice, went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Benjamin Elijah Mays, the great educator, went to Morehouse. And then if we jump forward into the civil rights era, a huge amount of civil rights activity comes out of the black colleges, and a huge number of civil rights leaders come out of the black colleges. Diane Nash and John Lewis, and that's John Lewis at the Selma March there, uh, went to Fisk in Nashville. Jesse Jackson went to North Carolina A&T. And interestingly, Jesse Jackson was not only the quarterback on the football team, but also the leader of the student protest movement. And there are other examples, actually, of student athletes at these HBCUs who were simultaneously very active in, in the movement. He wa it wasn't just Jesse Jackson. And so these schools were hubs of black aspiration and black achievement. And they were the only places in the South where a black person could get a college degree, could be a professor, could be a dean, could be a provost. Um, and what went with the academics of those schools was very much the athletic programs and the South being the South and football being as significant a sport for black Southerners as white Southerners, it was very true of the football programs. We're looking here at two coaches who I talk about in particular in my book, Eddie Robinson of Grambling in Northern Louisiana, Jake Gaither of Florida A&M, which is in Tallahassee. They were two of many superb coaches at the black colleges during their heyday, the 50s, the 60s. There, there were others as well, John Merritt at Tennessee State, Earl Banks at Morgan State in Baltimore, Ori Banks at South Carolina State, the man who would later become the Secretary of Education under George W. Bush, Rod Page, began his educational career as the football coach at Jackson State University in, uh, in Mississippi. So these football programs were important, and they're important in two ways. Number one, they were arguably among the best football programs of any kind in the entire country. And how can we say that when we never got to see, we never got to see a great Grambling team play a great Notre Dame team. We never got to see the University of Alabama Crimson Tide play the Florida A&M Rattlers. But one way we can surmise it is that a disproportionately high number of the pro draft picks 
during these golden years of black college football from I'd say you know the mid to late 40s on up through the early 1970s a disproportionate number were coming out of these HBCUs in some years more players would be drafted out of tiny Grambling total student body you know 5,000 roughly then we're coming out of USC or Michigan State or University of Georgia, much larger student bodies, much better known teams. So that's one way that we can surmise how, quali how high quality these programs were. The other thing is think of this. Look at a team in the Big 12 now. Look at a team in the SEC now. Look at a team in the ACC now. And then take like a, a mental pencil and erase every black player from that team. And then airbrush all those black players onto Grambling or Florida A&M or Jackson State or Tennessee State. All these players who make, you know, the, who make the Big 12 and the SEC and the ACC, these top football conferences, weren't going to those schools then. They couldn't go to those schools then. They were going by choice and also by necessity to these HBCU schools <laughs> instead. But the other thing that's significant here is that for these coaches, there was a very clear sense, and I know student athlete is a term that now is treated as, as ironic, or we say it rolling our eyes. I don't buy that. That's a whole longer discussion. I think it's still a concept that has a lot of validity, even though I also think student athletes should be remunerated for you know, in recognition of the revenue they make for everyone else. But putting that aside for the moment, although we can talk about it later if you have a question about it, these coaches saw their mission not as getting their players to the NFL or the AFL. They saw their mission as basically getting, using football scholarships to get players college educations. And most of their student athletes were the first people in their families ever to have gone to college. And I've talked to these men as part of my research. Now I'm talking about people in their 70s, 80s, even early 90s. And to a person, to a person they will say, I understood that my job was to get a college education, that playing football, getting a football scholarship was the means of getting it, but that getting the degree was the most important thing. And they would go to great lengths in various ways, these coaches, to try to bring home that point. Um, so first of all, the way some of these coaches handled themselves was very overtly to be role models you know, Eddie Robinson and Jake Gaither both had master's degrees, for instance. One reason they were great coaches is they were better educated than most white football coaches of that time. And they got their advanced degrees at top universities because not only could black students in the South had to get their bachelor's degrees at HBCUs, but most HBCUs at that time weren't allowed to have graduate schools. You couldn't get a graduate degree anywhere in the South if you were black. And so what the states would do to comply with their own doctrine of separate but equal is if you were an African-American resident of a southern state and were going to graduate school, they actually despised the idea, the white political structures, of a black student going to a university so much that they would give them money to go away. They'd give them a tuition stipend, get out of the south, go somewhere else. But the joke was kind of on them because as a result, these black coaches went to top research universities in the North. Jake Gaither got his master's at Ohio State and later did post-master's study at Yale. Eddie Robinson got his master's at the University of Iowa. People went to places like the University of Indiana, Teachers College at Columbia, NYU, University of Minnesota, places that were far better institutions than at that time the Alabamas and the Mississippis and the LSUs and the Georgias were. And so they were highly educated. That was something they modeled for their students. Uh, in the case of Eddie Robinson and Jake Gaither, they had lifelong marriages to fellow educators. Jake Gaither's wife was a professor of English. Eddie Robinson's wife was a high school English teacher and they modeled that for their students. And what they imbued their student athletes with was this idea of learning how to be, of becoming a dignified, educated church going, and that was a big part of it for them was going to church, making sure their players went to church as well. Young person, because they saw that as part of their commitment to the civil rights movement. 
People like Gaither and Robinson felt a lot of internal conflicts about being involved with the movement. Privately, they were extremely sympathetic. They certainly didn't believe in the concept of white supremacy, but they worked as many of these black football coaches did for state controlled universities. And if they got out there on the barricades themselves, they were liable to be fired. They were concerned if their players got active, that their players could be jailed, expelled from school, and conceivably killed. We know that those things happen. And they felt very proprietary and protective about their players. And so they're always looking for indirect ways to contribute to the movement. And one of the main ways for them was by developing students who were going to get their degrees, go into meaningful jobs, be these emblems of you know, dignity and self-possession with the idea that they're the walking, talking arguments for black equality. How can you deny black equality looking at young men like the ones we're turning out? Um, and part of what happens, though, by the season I'm writing about, well, let me just say one other thing about the coaches. It was, and then there were some younger coaches who were willing to be a bit bolder. Uh, Ori Banks, that's O-R-E-E. -E. Ori Banks was a young coach at South Carolina State during this period of the late 1960s. And he was a member of the NAACP. Now, I know these days, the NAACP, we think of a very moderate, mainstream civil rights organization. And if any of you know the history of you know, the 60s or the 70s, the NAACP was often being criticized by younger black activists from groups like SNCC or from the black nationalist movement for being too accommodationist. But through the 1950s and into the 1960s, in many southern states, it was illegal to be a member of the NAACP. It was against the law to be a member of the NAACP. If you read the mainstream, that is to say the white newspapers of that time, it was routine to have the NAACP likened to the Communist Party. And often those newspapers would publish lists of who the members of the NAACP are in a given town or a given county. And the reason that list was published was so their employers would then fire them. So then the employer would then say, hey, John, you know, I see here in the Ruston Leader, you're a member of the NAACP Grambling Chapter. If you still want to work at this lumber mill, you're going to have to quit. And so some of the younger coaches in Ori Banks in South Carolina State is emblematic of this, resisted that pressure, remained members of the NAACP, put themselves at risk. And Ori Banks was someone who was even more overt about his activism than older coaches. He was a, young, a generation younger than Eddie Robinson and Jake Gaither. And when there was a lot of student activism at South Carolina State, aimed mostly at the segregated businesses in downtown Orangeburg, his players came to him and basically said, what do we do? And what he said to them was, don't be on the wrong side of history. And just so you know, what the stakes were for being a student, a black student activist at that time. There's something that's now known as the Orangeburg Massacre. I don't know if, has anyone ever heard of it? Anyone know the Orangeburg Massacre? It's not surprising because it's never gotten the recognition it deserves, but it's February 8th, 1968. A group of student protesters from South Carolina State and a nearby private black college, Kaplan College, are protesting segregation at a bowling alley in downtown Orangeburg, South Carolina, and an all-white state police force comes in and open fire, opens fire. 27 or 28 students are injured, three of them are killed, two of them are football players. So it wasn't just an idle concern or worry that these coaches had about what would happen if their players got active in the movement. But what did happen by the season I write primarily about 1967 is that a lot of these coaches, I just don't want to cut too much into question time. I'm not bored, and I hope I'm not boring you. Um, a lot of these coaches by that time were coming under pressure from their younger players, from their assistant coaches who were younger than them, from civil rights activists on their campus for not doing more. Because these were some of the most respected black individuals in the entire states. Arguably, Jake Gaither at this time was the best known and most respected African-American man in the entire state of Florida. And so the fact that he wouldn't get out there overtly you know, active in the civil rights movement led the activists in Tallahassee, which had a very vibrant civil rights movement, to call him an Uncle Tom. Um, 
you know, and he knew it. He actually left his church there because the leader, the pastor of his church, Reverend C.K. Steele, who was the leader of civil rights activity in Tallahassee, was so critical of Jake Gaither for not joining him. And they would hear it from their young assistant coaches, and they would sense even the grumblings from their players. And uh, James Harris, who was the quarterback at Grambling at this time, and I'll talk more about him in a moment, told me when I entered him for my book about when Eddie Robinson would give these great orations about how great a country America was, and you could accomplish anything in America. And I do think Eddie Robinson sincerely believed that, but the players who loved him, who worshiped him, who revered him, who saw him as a father figure, in spite of all that, the players would go back to their dorms, shaking their heads, and say in a kind of a frustrated, quietly indignant way, Coach Rob sure waves the flag. It wasn't a compliment. And Robert Atkins, who was a tight end and safety on that team, then spent much of his post-pro football career um, on the faculty and staff at Prairie View A&M. Robert Atkins described to me, he said, we had watched on, t on TV as young men growing up the attack on the Selma marchers, the attack on the Birmingham marchers, the assassinations. And said, so we watched it in sorrow and rage. Okay, we watched it in sorrow and rage. And because of that sorrow and rage, they wanted their coaches to do something more. And part of what happens in 67 is that each of these coaches finally, metaphorically speaking, gets off the sideline in terms of what he's going to do on behalf of civil rights. And both of the things that happen are, I think, very broadly emblematic and worth spending some more time talking about. So for Eddie Robinson, what he does is he's working with James Harris to make him the first black quarterback to stick in the NFL. And Jake Gaither, who's there with the then governor of Florida, Claude Kirk, is working behind the scenes to be able to play the first black college versus white college football game in the history of the South. So let's sort of unpack each of them individually. Um, why is it such a big deal to have a black quarterback? I mean, think about it. This is 1967. Jackie Robinson, as you know from your own class, desegregated pro baseball 20 years earlier. 20 years earlier. And there had been black players in the NFL from about the same time. In fact, the first one is Tank Younger, who had also come out of Grambling, became a running back with the LA Rams. So we have black football players in the pros. Baseball's been desegregated. The NBA's been desegregated. What is the big deal about a black quarterback? Well, what I would argue is that the concept of a black quarterback goes right at some of the most deeply held and virulent precepts of segregation and of racism. Who, who here has played you know, high school football and been a quarterback? Any, any former quarterbacks? How thick is the playbook? That, yeah, right, and that's like high school. So what does a quarterback have to be? A quarterback has to be incredibly intelligent. I would say being a quarterback is the most cerebral position in any sport. A quarterback has to know not only what he does, he has to know what everybody does on his team. He has to know everything that the defense is likely to do. He has to assimilate all that information and then act it out under ever-changing game conditions. But what was the idea in, in a segregated society about black intellectual capacity. What was the idea? What was the assumption? I'm sorry? Yeah, that blacks are intellectually inferior. So you can't have a black quarterback because blacks can't possibly be smart enough to play quarterback. And then what's one of the slang terms for a quarterback? Anyone know it's a slang term we use? sort of sports jargon. The quarterback is the blank blank of the team. Two words. One syllable, three syllables. It, think of military. The field general. The quarterback's the field general. What does a general do? General <coughs> gives orders. Okay. What's the role of blacks in a segregated society like the South at this time? To give orders or to take orders? The role of the black man, particularly, is to take orders from whites. 
If you talk to black men in particular who grew up in that era, or the children of them, they'll talk about the most emasculating, humiliating thing that would be done would be to see their fathers called boy on the street, or to see them publicly humiliated and belittled in that way. That was the system. The whites give the orders, the blacks take the orders. So how can you have a black quarterback possibly in a position to give orders to white teammates? That can't happen in a segregated society. That can't be allowed to happen. And then finally, as I said before, there was a concept of the black as the quote, natural athlete, meaning sort of like an animal. But what does a quarterback have to be? A quarterback has to have these great qualities of character. A quarterback has to have composure, you know, to get brutally sacked and get up off the ground and not betray how hurt he is, you know, and show his courage. A quarterback has to rally the team's spirits when the team is down. A quarterback has to make a terrible mistake and then go back in on the next series after throwing a pick six and act as if it didn't happen and play with a totally clear head. But if you're talking about people who aren't quite human, who are fundamentally animalistic, they can't have that strength of character. And you know, this idea, by the way, is still with us. You know, before the, not this most recent Super Bowl, but the previous one, all the talk in sports media was Peyton Manning is such a great student of the game, which he definitely is. Peyton Manning has such great work habits, which he certainly does. Peyton Manning spends all this time in the film room, which I have no doubt is true, but that was contrasted to Russell Wilson of the Seahawks, and Russell Wilson is a great athlete, and Russell Wilson has great escapability, as if someone as short and slight as Russell Wilson, someone who doesn't have the physical means really, except maybe his arm, to be a pro quarterback, lacked those things, as if Russell Wilson wouldn't in fact need even more film study, even more of a work ethic, um, even you know, better analytics to be able to succeed because he doesn't have the physical skill set Peyton Manning has. In any case, so that's the other idea. Black can't have that strength of character. And so if you think about what you were looking at with Jackie Robinson and how difficult his path was, Jackie Robinson had to basically show two things. One, he had to show that he had the physical ability to play pro baseball. And two, he had to show that he had the ability to withstand the race hate to which he was going to be subjected. But when it came to a black NFL quarterback, you had to do both of those things and you had to address head on the issue of intellectual inferiority and weakness of character. You, so you had to be physically capable, you had to withstand the race hate, but you also had to show I'm a smart as a white person or smarter and I have as much strength of character as a white person or more. It's a much steeper hill to climb for a black quarterback. And there had been a handful of black quarterbacks who had made it into the pros prior to this time, but they would always be forced to change position. They would never be given a real chance. And in fact, one of the things that was most feared is that one of them might start to succeed. The year before James Harris gets to the pros, there's a player named Marlon Briscoe, who's a rookie quarterback out of University of Nebraska, Omaha, on the Denver Broncos. And because of injuries to the top two quarterbacks, Briscoe ends up becoming the, the starter as a rookie. And he goes on to throw like 14 touchdown passes in nine games. And he's this phenomenon, but he's a black quarterback and they waive him the next year. The Denver Broncos waive this emerging star because it's so controversial to have a black quarterback. There's a great quarterback who comes that same year out of Tennessee State named Eldridge Dickey. Sets all kinds of passing records, has an IQ of 130. Drafted in the first round by the Oakland Raiders. He's winning the starting job in training camp and the Raiders who overall were pretty good about drafting players out of the HBCUs and giving them a chance. Even the Raiders then demote him, put Ken Stabler out of Alabama as their starter, make Eldridge Dickey switch to being a flanker, and he's out of football in three years. That was what happened. And that was what Eddie Robinson and James Harris understood they were up against in developing him as a quarterback, that there had to be this whole very thought through effort to make him a quarterback. You know. If any of you have studied, you all know who Rosa Parks is, right? And 
Rosa Parks wasn't just some lady, as we sometimes are led to believe, who happened to be sitting on a bus one day and her feet hurt and she didn't want to change, give up her seat to a white person. Rosa Parks was a committed activist who had been part of the freedom movement in Montgomery, Alabama for years and years. And she had been prepared to be the public face of the movement. The movement there was waiting for the moment when someone on a bus wouldn't give up their seats and they would make public transportation the first issue of the civil rights struggle in Montgomery. Rosa Parks chose herself and then she was trained and it was the same with James Harris. James Harris decided as a junior in high school watching the I Have a Dream speech on his family's TV, he was not going to ever change positions. He gave up going to Michigan State where they wanted to make him a tight end so he could play quarterback. And Eddie Robinson recruited him specifically so he could break the barrier. And it was so important to Eddie Robinson, this was gonna be his contribution explicitly to the movement, that he re basically remade the whole Grambling football program to accommodate, okay, what James Harris wanted to do and what he wanted James Harris to accomplish. Grambling was a dominant team, but Grambling was basically a running team. Grambling was kind of like the Green Bay Packers under Vince Lombardi. We're gonna run 10 or 12 plays. You know what they are. We're gonna execute them so flawlessly and with such overwhelming physical force and precision that you can't stop us anyway. Grambling wanted the quarterback to be a game manager. Just don't make mistakes, don't lose us the game. But that was not gonna get a quarterback to the NFL. So Eddie Robinson brought in a whole bunch of wide receivers, several of them future pros like Frank Lewis and Charlie Joyner, Essex Johnson. He brought in um, an assistant coach, Doug Porter there, who is an expert in the passing game. And he worked with this fellow, um, Collie J. Nicholson. I don't know if any of you around UT have had the pleasure of encountering Michael Hurd, wonderful sports historian. Um, but Michael Hurd has written a great biography of Collie J. Nicholson, who was the sports publicist at Grambling and basically made Grambling into a national brand. But also he was the one who did kind of the, the psychological preparation with James Harris for hostile media interviews, for getting hate mail, for being booed, all the things that indeed would await him in the pros. And so just to cut to the chase with James Harris, he ends up getting drafted by the pros in 1969. Because he won't agree to change positions, he's not taken until the eighth round, even though he's one of the top quarterbacks in college football, he's the seventh string quarterback in the Buffalo Bills camp that summer, but he ends up winning the starting position and starts as a rookie in September 1969. Um, but what's really the most significant part of his career is in 1974, by then he's with the LA Rams. And in that year, he becomes the first black quarterback to win a division title with a team, win a playoff game with a team, gets within a game of the Super Bowl, leads the conference in passing efficiency, chosen for the Pro Bowl, becomes the Pro Bowl MVP. There's a straight line that goes from that year to Doug Williams and Warren Moon and Steve McNair and everyone on up to you know Colin Kaepernick and Russell Wilson and Cam Newton today. It all starts with what James Harris and Eddie Robinson accomplished, which was to prove here's someone who had not just the physical equipment, but the brain power the strength of character, the ability to withstand all the racism to open up that door. And so I think also the line doesn't just include football players because being a quarterback had so much to do with intellectual capacity. I really think it's not a stretch to think that it's somewhere in the process of electing a black president that you had a black quarterback at some point too. And then just quickly, Jake Gaither. Jake Gaither, as I said before, was often being pilloried in Tallahassee for not being supportive of enough publicly of the civil rights movement. In fact, worse than that, Jake Gaither was often cozying up to all the segregationist governors of Florida. During his years as a football coach, there are five different governors of Florida. All of them were in favor of segregation. And Jake Gaither would send them congratulatory letters when they won election, and he would donate money to their campaigns, and he would even keep a small portion of the seats in Florida A&M's home stadium, Bragg Stadium, roped off for white legislators. So they could go to a game, you know, without encountering black people, you know, like rubbing up against any black skin, God forbid. 
And people in Tallahassee were just beside themselves, people in the movement. How can Jake Gaither, who's so educated, who's so proud, debase himself this way? How can he just kowtow to the white man this way? But what no one knew is that Gaither was saving up all this political clout. By doing those things, he was playing the long game. He was building up political leverage. And in 1967, he utilized it. He went behind the scenes to the governor, to the all-white board of regents, the, that was in charge of the state universities of Florida, to the all-white legislature, and basically said, I want permission to play a game against a white team. And they knew they couldn't turn him down because he'd accumulated so much political, so many political favors, and they didn't want to make him into a, a really overt you know, public foe of theirs, because then they'd really have problems. But they didn't want to agree to the game officially, because they were afraid they thought, oh, you know, there'll be a race ride. What would happen if Florida A&M beats Florida or beats Florida State or beats Miami? We can't let that happen. Um, and then the people who are even more segregationist than we are are going to vote us out of office for allowing this game to happen. So what they did is they made a verbal agreement with Gaither that the game could be played, but they left no written proof. There is no written evidence of that. But two years later, Gaither found a team willing to play him. The University of, My of Tampa they no longer play football, but at that time they were kind of what we call now a mid-major. They were beating SEC and Big 8 teams, sending people to the pros. And their coach, Fran Kersey, was very interested in desegregating the program there. And so he agreed to play this game against Florida A&M. And I'll stop here and just tell you, you know, I think you've heard or you will hear soon about the very important game between USC and Alabama in 1970 when USC, with a black quarterback and many black players, beats all-white Alabama. But that game actually comes a year later than this game. This game, which never got as much renown, was the first desegregated college football game in the South. And it sells out Tampa Stadium. Florida a and wins the game, which is hugely important, proves the capacity of their coach and of their team. But I say the most important part of it is that it's the largest desegregated public event in the history of the South. And this is really mind-boggling. From 1863, you know, from emancipation until November 29, 1969, this is the largest desegregated event. It's not anything else. It's a football game. It's a football game. And again, thinking of the importance of football in the South, you can imagine the ripples that sends out. There's no riot. There's no fighting. People get along. And it's a sign that this system of segregation of public facilities just isn't sustainable anymore. So let me stop there and take what questions, what questions you have in the time left. That's a great question. Were there times when teams desegregated and white players left in protest? I don't know that off the top of my head, but I have no doubt that it, that it would have happened. What I do know is that there were cases when white teams in the South would be set up to play bowl games against integrated teams and sometimes would turn down bowl invitations because of who they'd be playing. So I, I know examples of that. At the level of the individual player, I'm not sure. I've, I have no reason to doubt that it must have occurred. Yeah. So we've accomplished these milestones, et cetera. What would you like to see, or what do you think we'd still lack to achieve as far as equality, et cetera? That's a great question. What, what's the remaining agenda? Well, I think that um, probably the biggest thing is at the level of, of leadership in sports. Um, the NFL has done a much better job than the NCAA in terms of the diversity of, in the NFL, it's, we're talking head coaches and general managers. In you know, the BCS, we'd be talking about head coach and athletic directors. Um, the reason the, N, the NFL has done better is it has an affirmative action program. It's called the Rooney Rule. And it basically says that if you have a head coaching opening or, or a general manager opening a couple of other top positions, you must interview at least one non-traditional candidate. 
Initially, that was specifically black candidate, African-American. Now it could be also Latino or female or Asian-American. And what the Rooney Rule, while, it, while its implementation hasn't been perfect, what it's shown is that when you look for a diverse range of candidates, you find qualified people. And so here, let me, I actually have some of the photos. So when you get into the NFL, you know, you're talking about people like Jim Caldwell, who's the coach at the Lions, Martin Mayhew, who's their um, general manager, um, Tony Dungy and Lovey Smith, who were head coaches, went against each other in the Super Bowl, Jerry Reese of the New York Giants, Ozzie Newsome of the Ravens, Mike Tomlin of the Steelers. So you have a, a pretty significant representation of African Americans, as well as some Latinos like Ron Rivera on the Panthers, at top levels in the NFL because it's been a priority. In the BCS, it's lagged way behind. Um, I mean, Texas, to its credit, hired Charlie Strong. It's one of the handful of top programs that's hired an African American head coach. But we all know that there was some pushback and criticism by one of the top boosters here, which is a sign of what the struggle is. The problem at the NCAA level is that there's a power of alumni, there's a power of donors, and there's a power of what's sometimes called, quote, regional culture that keeps, you know, real equality and fairness in hiring from being enacted as often as it should be. Um, you know, I've talked some about Mississippi earlier today. This is a good example of, of these, quote, regional, you know, ways. Mississippi's, you know, mascot is still a Confederate soldier, Colonel Reb short for rebel. Think about that. They tried to change their, um, their mascot to a bear four or five years ago, and there was an outcry, fr outcry from throughout the state. So they stuck with it. Why is it even called Ole Miss? You notice I don't use the term Ole Miss, because Ole Miss was a plantation term. It was an endearment for the matriarch of the plantation. You know, like Ole Miss, like Miss as opposed to Misses. So Ole Miss, that's what the slaves were supposed to, out of respect and endearment, call the matriarch of the plantation. So think about it. I spoke at the University of Mississippi last year, and I was talking to a couple of very high-ranking African Americans in their athletic department. And I said, what's it like to recruit for this place? And they said, we spend the first half hour with every black family we go to trying to explain, you know, the, you know, explain away the mascot and, you know, and the nickname of the school. Because right away, it's, you know, understandably off-putting. So I think that there's work at the hiring level and even in some cases with things like mascots at the NCAA. That's where more work needs to be done. And I think the other thing is really going back to the ideal of the scholar-athlete that I think two things can coexist. I think there is a sensible way that you can give remuneration, give some compensation to players whose on the field exploits make money for everybody else, you know, from the college bookstore that tells the t-shirts to ESPN to whoever's making money from the luxury boxes in the stadium, but simultaneously not think that college football should be the minor leagues. I think that's totally cynical. I'd hate to see college football become like college basketball with a one and done mentality. You know, I think there's a way that these HBCU programs, and still some of the best major college programs like Stanford and Notre Dame, you know, have players who go to class who graduate, because, you know, the average pro football career is three years. And if you don't have something else, if you don't have that degree, you know, God help you the rest of your life making a decent living. Um, I just wanted to ask what you think the future of college football programs at HBCUs are. Since uh, many black players want to go play for Alabama or ET. It's a great question, and I get that question whenever I speak at an HBCU, or I've spoken to a lot of African-American churches as well. That question always comes up because there's this fantastic history and legacy of black college football, and it's still beloved. I mean, the black college classic games, like the State Fair Classic that's played in Dallas every September, and the Bayou Classic in New Orleans, get like 40, 50, 60,000 spectators still. But unfortunately, the reality is that if you're an African-American high school player, a top prospect, you know, if you go to an HBCU, you're not going to be on TV nearly with the exposure 
You're not going to have the extraordinary facilities that you're going to have if you go to Texas or, you know, LSU or, you know, Penn State or, or wherever. And, uh, you know, and those things, you're not going to have the same equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the gravity, of course, pulls those top players to, you know, what, what are now called, if you've heard the term PWI, and I don't know that term, predominantly white institution, kind of the antonym for HBCU. So they'll go to a PWI. And, you know, I've heard James Harris, who's totally devoted to HBCUs in their history, ask that question. And he says, you know, like with some, you know, chagrin, look, I can't tell any individual player to give up a chance, you know, to be on ESPN as often as you're going to get on if you go to Alabama. Um, but the risk with that is that they're treated as commodities at many of those schools. Not all of them, but in many of them treated as commodities, and that's not been the tradition at the HBCUs. But it's hard to imagine what will ever bring, <coughs> what could ever bring HBCUs with their limited budgets, with their smaller facilities, with their smaller media profile into a position to compete for a lot of the top prospects. I mean, there's still players who come out of the HBCUs to the pros like, you know, um, Dominique Rogers, Cromartie, and Jacoby Jones, and and others, but it's you know a sprinkling of players now, whereas it used to be you know a multitude. Yes. I wanted to ask, what is your opinion about student athletes becoming part of this? Like, just right now, we're talking a lot about um, how athletes, especially younger ones, are doing more about rights, about black rights, and all the whole like I can't breathe and all that kind of stuff. Like, do you think? No, I think, I think the increasing political activism, this upsurge has been a really healthy thing because I think that there was a period of time kind of unfortunately typified by Michael Jordan in which the ideal became that in order to, be a, to have the most endorsements, to have the most earning power after your career is over, even during it, you should always steer clear of politics. Don't say anything controversial. Don't take a stand on, on anything. And I think that was a really dreadful example because, as I'm sure you've learned in this class already, Paul Robeson, Joe Lewis, Jesse Owens, Jackie Robinson, Jim Brown, there's a whole history that came up close to the present day of black athletes being very engaged with, you know, with political issues, you know, issues of civil rights, issues of the anti-war movement during the Vietnam years, you know, issues of poverty, or we now call it income inequality, in general, and then that sort of stopped for a while, and I think part of the reason it stopped is that suddenly the earning power, if you could be this crossover figure like Jordan, became so astronomical, way beyond what athletes could ever think about before, that the temptation was don't get involved. And also individual athletes of any color became a lot more surrounded by gatekeepers and advisors and publicists and people keeping them from having encounters with average, with average Joes. You know, I have a friend who wrote a book about the last Brooklyn Dodger team to win a World Series in 1956, I think it was. Those guys rode the subway. They lived in middle-class neighborhoods. They encountered ordinary people, and very few pro athletes compared to that do that now. So I think the fact that, you know, LeBron James has taken a real leading role in this, I think is great because he's someone who financially could stand at a total distance, but he's been outspoken, whether it's been on Donald Sterling or on you know, some of the issues this past year involving you know, police brutality. So I think that's all to the good. Yeah. Um, do you think HBCUs perpetuate segregation? I'm sorry? Do you think HBCUs perpetuate segregation? Perpetuate segregation? I don't. I think, first of all, they're all integrated now by law. And I think, if anything, the interesting challenge HBCUs have is similar to what women's colleges had when they started to get desegregated by gender. Many of them in the you know 60s and 70s, which is say, okay, if I'm Prairie View or Hampton or Morehouse or Spelman, and now white kids or white students may come here, Latino students may come here, international students may come here, Asian American students may come here. What? is the value, the special value of going to an HBCU for those students. What's uniquely important? Just like my daughter goes to Vassar, which had been an all-women's school in up to, I think, the early 70s or late 60s, and had to figure out for itself, 
what's the value for a male to go to what had been a traditionally all-female school? And I think that the HBCUs are in the process of wrestling with that exact question and, and figuring that out. And I don't think the answer is totally clear yet. 